Hello, and welcome to your tree-based models lecture. Today, we're going to talk about a bunch of different models, but at their core, all of them use decision trees. So let's talk about what that is. I like to say that decision trees are just flowcharts we make with math, and using them, we're able to make predictions about some data that we have. The way we represent these flowcharts are with trees, so let's talk about a little bit of vocabulary that will help us describe these trees. In general, a tree has two very important things. The first thing are nodes. Nodes are just a container that allow us to store various data points or values. And in a tree, we have a hierarchical structure, so nodes are then split into other nodes. So the two things we're often thinking about when we're talking about trees are the nodes and the splits. In a tree, the topmost node is called the root node. This is where the tree begins. Another term we need to be familiar with is parent node. Parent nodes are nodes, including root nodes, that have splits and then nodes below it. These nodes that our parent nodes are split into are called child nodes. Child nodes are nodes that come from a split of a parent node. If a child node does not itself have any children, in other words, it's the end of the tree along that branch, it is referred to as a leaf node. And leaf nodes are very important in decision trees because leaf nodes are where we actually make predictions. So if we're building a decision tree using math, it's sort of like playing that game 20 questions. Let's say I'm thinking of an item and I say, well, the first question I want to know is whether it's alive or not. That is going to create a root node because it's my first question, and it basically divides the world of all possible things into two child nodes. So I can say one child node is yes, it's alive, and another is no, it's not alive. Let's say that I tell you that my object is alive. Your next question might be, is it a plant? So I would divide this and I would say plant, not plant, and I would create another layer of nodes. Now I would repeat this over and over and over and hopefully I would get to narrow down my guess so that I can make a really good prediction about what the thing is I'm trying to predict. All right, let's look at a really simple example. Let's say that we're trying to classify animals as either birds or not birds. A very simple decision tree we could use to do this is this one, where we only really have one root node and two children node. One really simple decision tree we could use is this one. In this case, we only ask a single question, can the animal fly? If it can, then we classify it as a bird. If it can't, then we classify it as not a bird. Now look. This is not going to work all the time, right? Think of emus. Those are birds, but they can't fly. And we would, in this case, misclassify that bird as not a bird. So what if we add to our decision tree to help it make a little bit more nuanced predictions? In this case, if an animal can't fly, we then further ask the question of whether or not it has feathers. If it does, we classify it as a bird. If we don't, we classify it as not a bird. This takes care of our emu error before. While an emu can't fly, it does have feathers, so we would still classify it as a bird. And typically, we wouldn't stop there. We would be able to add more and more splits, more and more features, so that our tree could make a very good, nuanced prediction. And the variables that we use to create these splits does not have to be categorical. For instance, in the previous examples, I was just using categorical variables like can fly, can't fly, has feathers or doesn't, but I can also use continuous variables to split my tree. For instance, let's say I'm trying to predict whether or not someone plays Fortnite. One way I could do this is by using their age as a predictor. I could say if you're below 20, I'm going to predict yes, you do play Fortnite, and if you're above 20 or 20 itself, I will predict that you do not play Fortnite. So we've just looked at how decision trees work, but I previously said that decision trees are built with math. So what is that math? Well, in order to build a good decision tree, we need to know what variables to create splits on that will allow us to efficiently partition our data into the categories that we care about. The two main ways that we do that are with Gini and Purity, and entropy. Remember, entropy is a measure of uncertainty or chaos or surprise. So the less entropy we have, it means we've done a better job at partitioning data into groups where that group is mostly one category. 
In other words, we've done a good job at figuring out what data points are in what category. Thus, lower entropy means that a split helped us make a better decision. Genie impurity, on the other hand, measures basically the same thing, but in a slightly different way. Genie impurity measures the purity of a node. The more pure a node is, the more it tends to have data points from only a single category. If a node in a tree has data points from only a single category, it means the splits we made did a good job of figuring out which data points were in which category. In either case, both genie impurity and entropy measure essentially the same thing, just in slightly different ways. You can even see from this plot that when genie impurity thinks something is good, entropy will also think it's good. All right, so let's dig into the math of how we actually generate our decision tree. As we saw before, decision trees are made up of nodes that are then split into subnodes and so on and so forth. So how do we decide what variables to use to split our nodes? Well, here's where the math comes in. Let's say that we are building a model to predict whether or not people have cats. And we're going to use various variables like whether they had a childhood pet, whether they work from home, whether they have children and their income as a way to predict whether or not they have a cat. We're going to use genie impurity to decide which split will help us make a better decision. In order to do this, let's first calculate the overall genie impurity of the entire data set. This basically says if we made no splits and we basically didn't have a decision tree, what is the impurity of our data in general? In order to do this, we have to take our data and look at how many people have cats and how many people do not have cats. Well, in the data set as a whole, there are six people that have cats and four that do not. Using this formula for genie impurity, we can calculate the overall impurity of the data set before we've made any split. In order to do that, we're going to say 1 minus 6 over 10 squared plus 4 over 10 squared. In the formula for genie impurity, what we're doing is we're taking 1 minus the sum of the probability of a category squared for all of the categories in our data. In this case, the probability of having a cat in the data set is 6 over 10, because 6 out of 10 people have cats. The probability of not having a cat is 4 out of 10, because 4 out of 10 people do not have cats. When we plug this all in, we get that our overall genie impurity for the data set is 0.4. So we're looking to see if there's a variable that we can use to split our data that will give us a better genie impurity than 0.48. Let's go ahead and try out one of our variables. We'll start with the work from home variable. So we're going to take all of our data and we are going to split by work from home. So on the left hand side, we're going to have people that do not work from home. And on the right hand side, we're going to have people that do work from home. In this data set, the people that do not work from home are this person, this person, this person, this person, and this person. Of those people, one has a cat and four do not. Let's go ahead and calculate the genie impurity of the left hand node. Our genie impurity is one minus the sum of the probability of each category squared. In our data set for the left hand node, the probability of having a cat is one over five. So we're going to calculate the genie impurity by saying one minus one over five, that probability squared, plus the probability of not having a cat, which in this node is four out of five and then we'll square it. Plugging this in, we get an overall impurity of the left-hand node of 0.32. Now let's move on to people who do work from home. That would be this person, this person, this person, this person, and this person. For these people, all of them have cats. So we have five cats, zero with no cat. So let's calculate the genie impurity for the right-hand node. We're going to use our formula again, which is going to be one minus, and then the probability of having a cat, which is five out of five for the right hand node squared plus the probability of not having a cat which is zero out of five squared. As you can see our genie impurity for the right hand node is going to be zero. This is the best genie impurity that we can possibly have. As you can see the lower your genie impurity the more a node tends to be a single category rather than having a split between our two categories. So now that we have the impurity for the left hand node and the right hand node, we are going to create an overall impurity score for the split. 
Basically, if we split by this variable, how much does it improve our impurity overall? In order to do this, we're going to take a weighted average of the two node impurities. We're going to weight by the number of data points that are in each node. Essentially, the more data is in a node, the more that node's impurity has a say in the overall impurity. So in this case, we're going to take the proportion of data points in the left-hand node, or 5 over 10, times the impurity for that node, so 0.32. Then we're going to add the proportion of data points in the right-hand node, which is also 5 out of 10, and multiply it by the impurity for that node, which is 0. Taking this all together, we get an overall impurity of 0.16 for the split as a whole. Since our genie impurity for the data set before we split started out at 0.8, and now it's at 0.16, we can see that splitting on work from home allows us to make better predictions about who does and does not own a cat. The lower our genie impurity, the bigger the improvement in our ability to make those predictions. But work from home is not the only variable we could split on. Let's try another one, like whether or not people have children in the home. Let's start with people that do not have children children in the home. Out of the people who do not have children, three of them have cats and zero of them have no cats. To calculate the impurity, we are going to take one minus the probability of having a cat, which in this case is three out of three for the left-hand node, squared, plus the probability of not having a cat, which is zero over three squared. We could do these calculations if we want, but we already know that if a node has only a single category, its impurity is going to be zero. Now let's look at people who do have children. Of these people, three of them have cats and four have no cats. So to calculate the overall impurity, we are going to take one minus the probability of having a cat, which for the right hand node is three out of seven and then squared, plus the probability of not having a cat, which in this case is four out of seven squared, and we get an overall impurity of about 0.49. Four, nine. Now we have the impurity for the left-hand node and the right-hand node, so let's calculate a weighted average so we know the overall impurity of the split. We're going to take the proportion of data points in the left-hand node, which is 3 out of 10, and multiply it by the impurity for that node, which is 0. Then we're going to add the proportion of data points in the right-hand node, which is a 7 out of 10, times the impurity for that node, which is about 0.4. When we do that, we get an overall impurity for the split of 0.343. Now remember, our overall genie impurity, if we don't make any splits, is 0.48. So this split still improves our ability to predict who does and does not have a cat. However, it doesn't improve the impurity quite as much as splitting on work from home did. And that's exactly how we decide which variables to split on when making our decision tree. We calculate the impurity when we split on different variables, like whether you had a childhood pet, whether you work from home, and whether you have children. And whichever one reduces our impurity the most is the one that we're going to pick. So remember, if we split on work from home, our overall impurity was 0.16. Children, we just found out, is 0.343. And if you do the calculations yourself, you should see that splitting on pet would be an impurity of 0.4. Now, all of these improve upon the genie impurity of 0.48 that we originally had in the data. But the one that improves it the most is work from home. And so that is the variable that we would choose to start our decision tree split. However, you might be wondering, there's another possible predictor here, income. We could split on income, and you're 100% correct. However, making splits for a continuous variable is a little more tricky because we have to decide where we are going to split this variable. When we have a continuous variable, we need to try every single possible split and see which one is the best. In this case, very luckily, income is already in order from lowest to highest. And the first possible split that we could make is we could split people by income right between these two values. In other words, we are going to split on whether or not income is less than or equal to $46.15,000. 
the way I got this number was just taking the midpoint between the two values we're splitting between. When we split our data using this threshold, only one person has an income less than 46,000, and that person has a cat. So there is one person that has a cat and zero that have no cat. On the other hand, there are nine people who do not make less than $46,000. Out of those people, five have a cat and four do not. So just like before, we can calculate the impurity of each of our nodes using this split. So the left-hand node, the impurity is going to be one minus the probability of having a cat for this node, which is five over nine and then squared, plus the probability of not having a cat in this node, which is four out of nine and then squared. When we plug all of this in, we get an overall impurity for the left-hand node of about 0.49. Now we need to calculate the impurity of the right-hand node, and we could plug it into the formula, but we already know that if all of our data points are in a single category, the Gini impurity is going to be zero. Then we can take a weighted average of these two nodes. Now most of the data is on the left hand side, so it's going to have a lot more of an influence on the overall impurity of the split. To calculate this, we're going to say the proportion of data points in the left hand node, which is 9 out of 10, times the impurity for the left hand node, which is 0 0.49, plus the proportion of data points in the right hand node, or 1 over 10, times the impurity for that node, which is zero. All in all, this gets us an overall impurity of 0.44 for the entire split. Now again, our original impurity started at 0.48, so this is an improvement, but it's not enough of an improvement to make this split a better choice than the ones that we had before when we split on pet, work from home, or children. But we're not done because that was not the only possible threshold we could use. We could also split our data right here. In this case, this is essentially the same thing as saying is income less than or equal to $64.9 thousand dollars. In this data set, there are only two people who do have an income lower than that threshold. One of them has a cat and the other does not. Of the people that make more than that threshold, we have five who have cats and three that do not. Now, we won't do all of the tedious calculations together, but as you can see, we would need to calculate the impurity for every possible split that we have. I encourage you to try some of these by hand just to make sure that you understand how to calculate Gini impurity. Once we calculate the impurity for each of these thresholds, we can use it to choose whichever one is the lowest. Remember, low impurity means we did a good job of distinguishing who has cats and who doesn't. For this variable, the lowest impurity we find is when we split right here, and it gives us an impurity of 0.343. We can then include this in our comparison of the different variables we may want to split up. Remember, our goal is to reduce the Gini impurity or entropy of our data. Our original Gini impurity was 0.48, and we calculated what the overall impurity would be if we split on the various predictors that we have available. Out of all of these possible splits, we are going to choose to split on work from home, because when we do, we reduce our Gini impurity the most. And this is how we create an entire decision tree. Every time we need to make a split, we basically calculate the entropy or the Gini impurity of the parent node. And then we try all the possible splits we could make and see which one reduces the Gini impurity or entropy the most. That's the split that we would choose to add to our tree. So how do we decide when to stop adding splits to our tree? Well, remember, the whole point of making a split is to reduce the Gini impurity or entropy we pick the split that reduces it the most. But if we are not able to reduce the Gini impurity or entropy of a split, then we'll just stop there. For instance, let's say that we have an impurity in the left-hand node of zero. There is literally no way that we could improve our ability to make predictions here. So we would just stop and we wouldn't add any further split. So again, to review, when building a decision tree, we are going to, for every node, see if splitting that node by any of our predictors is able to decrease the Gini impurity or entropy of that node. We'll choose whichever variable to split on that reduces it the most. However, if we reach a point that splitting on different variables does not improve the Gini impurity or entropy, we will stop and that node will become a leaf node. Now, why are leaf nodes like this and this and this and this 
so important. In a decision tree, leaf nodes are where we actually make predictions. Once we've built out a tree so that all of the splits improve the genie impurity or entropy of the tree, we take the leaf nodes and we use them to make predictions. When a data point ends up in a leaf node, we predict that it is the majority class in that node. So if this node had mostly cat owners, we would predict that anyone who ends up in that node is going to be a cat owner. If most of the people that end up in this node are not cat owners, then we would predict that anyone who reaches that node is not a cat owner. Once we've actually built a decision tree, we have a very useful thing called variable or feature importance that allows us to ask the question, how much does a certain feature in our data set, like working from home, having childhood pets, actually reduce node impurity throughout the entire decision tree? In order to calculate variable importance, we basically compare the impurity of a node before splitting on this variable with the weighted impurity after splitting on that variable. In other words, we're looking at the impurity of the parent node compared to the children nodes that were created when we split on this variable. If the impurity of the parent node was really high and the impurity of the children nodes weighted is really low, then that means that this variable is very important. It allows us to reduce the impurity a lot. However, if you think about the case where the parent node's impurity is relatively the same as the weighted child node's impurity, then that variable is not very important. It did not actually reduce the impurity that much. So the bigger this importance number, the more this variable was able to reduce the impurity when we split on it. However, when we're building a really deep, complicated tree, we're often gonna split on the same variable multiple different times throughout the tree structure. So in order to get the overall variable importance, we first have to take the sum of the importance importance for all splits that split on that variable, and then divide it by the sum of the importances for all splits in the tree. This gives us a value that tells us, for this predictor, how much did it improve the performance of the tree or reduce the impurity when we split on it throughout the entire tree. Another way we can measure variable or feature importance is by taking the variable that we're interested in and scrambling or randomly shuffling the values. We keep the rest of the data exactly where it is, but we take this one column we're interested in and we shuffle it. Once we do this, all of the values from that column are now in a random order. This breaks any relationship that this variable had with the thing that we're trying to predict because we've randomly scrambled the information in that column. Thus, if we send our data through the tree and it no longer makes good predictions, then that original variable was very important in determining the thing we're trying to predict. If we scramble our feature and nothing really changes, it means that that variable was not that important in making our predictions. All right, so we talked a lot about decision trees, which are a class of model that allow us to put data into different categories by making a flowchart that we build with math. However, we don't just have to predict categorical variables. We can also predict continuous variables. Technically, these are called regression trees because the thing that we're trying to predict is a continuous value. But luckily, all the concepts behind building regression trees are the same as for decision trees. The main difference is that instead of predicting a category, we're predicting a number, like maybe the weight of an animal. So if we ask if it can fly and it can, we'll predict it's 10 grams. And if it can't fly, we'll predict it's 700 grams. In a decision tree, when we make a prediction, we are taking the mode or the most common category in our leaf nodes. But for a regression tree, we instead take the mean or the average of all of the values in our node. Another quick difference is that we still add splits based on which splits improve our predictions the most. But instead of measuring that with things like Gini impurity and entropy, we measure that using things like the mean squared error. Thus, we add splits that reduce our mean squared error 
the most. So we just spent a lot of time talking about how to build a decision tree. But to be completely honest with you, in real life, people rarely use individual decision trees as a model to make predictions. Rather, we use individual decision trees in an ensemble. The most common type of ensemble is a random forest. Now, you may be asking, what is an ensemble? Well, an ensemble is just a collection of smaller models that we put together in order to make overall predictions. In this case, this means we're going to fit a bunch of different decision trees and then use all of them together in order to make a single prediction. Random forests are a type of ensemble that use a bunch of trees. Get it? It's a forest made out of trees. But we don't want to fit a bunch of decision trees to the exact same set of data. That would be really boring and not very useful. So instead, random forests make a bunch of different trees, but they fit them on slightly different data. In order to do that, we look at two different things, bagging, which is short for bootstrap aggregating, and random feature selection. In random forests, we use bootstrapping to create a different random sample of rows for each tree to be fit on. This means that each tree is going to see a slightly different combination of rows. Because we're sampling with a replacement, it means that in each sample for each of our trees, some rows might show up more than once, while other rows won't show up at all. Essentially what we're doing is we're treating our original sample like a population, and we're randomly sampling from it with replacement to create a new sample of the same size. So using bagging, each tree is going to see a slightly different set of rows. However, we also might want them to see slightly different sets of columns. That's where random feature selection comes in. Just like with bagging, we are going to have each tree fit on a subsample of the columns we have available. However, for columns, we don't sample with replacement because that wouldn't make sense to have two copies of the same column. So again, random forests are collections of decision or regression trees, where each tree is fit on a slightly different subsample of rows and a slightly different subsample of columns. This gives us a bunch of different trees that have slightly different perspectives on the data and are using that to make predictions. Now, each individual tree is going to make a prediction. So how do we decide what the overall prediction is? Well, we just let them vote. Each tree gets a vote at what it thinks the answer should be. For categorical predictions, we'll just take the majority prediction from all of the tree's prediction. For a regression problem, we might take something like the average prediction from all the trees. In random forests, we probably want to think especially about two different things when we're building them. One is the number of trees that we're going to build, and two is the number of features that each tree is going to get fit on. Now, one nice thing about random forests is that because the trees are all fit on individual subsamples of data, they're completely independent. The output of one tree does not impact the output of another. However, there's a different type of tree-based ensemble model called gradient boosting trees, which have trees that do depend on each other. Just like in a random forest, in gradient boosting trees, we have an ensemble of multiple trees. However, unlike a random forest, our trees are not independent. Rather, the trees rely on each other. In a gradient boosting tree, we take the predictions of each tree and add them them together. This is contrasting with a random forest where we either take the average or the mode of the tree predictions to make our final prediction. The reason we do this is that each subsequent tree predicts the errors made by the previous trees. So for instance, in this example, our first tree is just going to make some type of baseline prediction. And the second tree is going to try and predict the errors made by the first tree. The third tree is going to try and correct the errors made by the first two combined, and so on and so forth. The reason why this works is pretty simple if you look at an example. Let's say that I'm trying to predict all of your ages, and here's the age of four different people. Maybe my initial guess is just to say, I'm going to predict the average age, because if I don't know anything else about you, that's the best I can do. So for each of you, I predict that you are 20 years old. Well, when I make that prediction, there's a residual or an error the difference between your actual age and my prediction. So this means that our actual value, so your actual age, is equal to 
the original prediction I made plus whatever the residual is. That means if we have an original prediction and we have something that can predict what that residual is, if we add those two things together, we will get closer to our actual value. And that's exactly what's happening in gradient boosting trees. Each subsequent tree is trying to predict the error or the residuals made by the previous trees. If that tree can accurately predict what that residual or error will be, then it can help correct the mistakes that are being made by the previous trees. In real life, instead of adding all of the trees together, we actually add all of the trees together multiplied by some small value. This basically says that every time we add a tree that's trying to correct errors, we're gonna make a small change based on that tree. This helps us prevent overfitting and making wild swings in the predictions that we're making. So to write this a different way, in gradient boosting trees, we start off with some baseline value like Z0 in the formula on the bottom. We then incrementally add the predictions of further trees. These trees are basically trying to get us just a little bit closer to the correct guess. So in this case, we said that each tree is going to try and predict the errors made by the previous tree and use that in order to make our prediction better. But how do we choose these values that subsequent trees are actually going to predict? In the example we went over for gradient boosting trees, each tree's job was to predict the error, the actual minus the predicted value, that was made by all of the previous trees before it. This works specifically when we have a continuous value that we're predicting and the way that we're measuring the performance of our model is with squared error. However, we want to generalize the math so that even if we're not predicting a continuous value or we're not using squared error as our loss function, that we can still take advantage of gradient boosting. In general, when building gradient boosting trees, each tree should predict the negative gradient of the loss with respect to our prediction. Gradients are just partial derivatives. And remember, derivatives tell us if we change our prediction, how does that change the loss? In other words, it tells us what adjustments to make to our prediction to improve our loss. Now remember, in a gradient boosting tree, predictions from the overall ensemble of trees is just the sum of all of their outputs, maybe weighted by some number like 0.1 so that we're just making small adjustments to our prediction. We start with some baseline prediction like the most common category or the average value if it's a continuous value. And then for each tree that we have, we add our value that the tree is predicting, again, potentially multiplied by some small number, so that instead of making big adjustments, we're only making small adjustments to our prediction. If you notice, that means that each tree is just the sum of the previous tree's prediction plus the value that we're trying to predict for this tree. All right, so remember, we said that in general, we are going to have each tree in our gradient boosting tree ensemble predict the negative gradient of the loss with respect to the prediction. Remember, gradients are just partial derivatives, so this means how do we change our prediction in order to reduce our loss? In other words, what can we add to our tree in order to make our prediction better. Negative gradients tell us what adjustments we could make to our prediction in order to reduce the loss. To prove to you why we were predicting errors in the example we did before, let's look at squared error as a loss. In this case, our loss is just going to be the actual value minus the prediction made by the ensemble squared. You can trust me on this one. I don't expect you to be able to do this by hand, but when we take the negative gradient of our loss, with respect to the prediction P made by our ensemble, we get out this, two times the actual value minus the predicted value. This value, two times Y minus P, is our negative gradient. And notice that if we just ignore the two, which is just a constant value, this is just the error made by our ensemble. And that's why in our original example, all of our subsequent trees were predicting the errors made by the previous ensemble. That's because in this case, when we use squared error as our loss and we have a continuous value, the error made by the previous ensemble is the negative gradient. So after the first tree, we were just having each tree 
predict the negative gradient of the loss with respect to all of the previous trees. So to review, when we have the simple case of predicting a continuous value and using squared error as a way to measure the loss of our model, then we are just going to have each tree predicting the errors made by the previous trees. However, what we just went over showed us that we can generalize this to other cases where we have categorical variables or we want to use a different loss other than squared error. In all of those cases, when we add trees to our ensemble, we will make sure that each of those trees predicts the negative gradient of the loss with respect to our prediction. In other words, each tree asks, what adjustments can we make to our prediction to reduce or improve our loss? All right, that's all I have for you. I will see you next time.